News Magazine salutes Education Week with films of an Indian residential school. They have a total of 11,000 pupils, orphans, convalescents, those who live too far in the wilderness to get to a daily school. They learn not only games and traditions, such as the celebration of St. Valentine's Day, but the mastery of words, which will open to them the whole range of the ordinary Canadian curriculum. They come to school in September, go home for holidays in June. Instead of the isolation and neglect of the past, a free and equal chance for children in urban centers. In the late 19th century, many Americans had grown tired of the ongoing costs of the constant war against Indians on the frontier and an alternative was needed. Indian boarding schools were erected all around the country. In 1893, an eight-classroom building opened with the purpose of educating Native American children. Enrollment soared soon after and more buildings were needed, eventually totaling 11. Boys and girls dormitories, a hospital, woodworking and blacksmith shop, industrial training building, dining hall, clubhouse for employees, gymnasium, and farm buildings. Average enrollment was over 300, with students from all over Michigan, as well as Minnesota, New York, and Wisconsin, with the hopes of their parents to receive a good, well-rounded education. The school also took in orphans, abandoned, and poor children. The curriculum focused on vocational training and religious education, including how to fit into white culture. After its closure, the Department of Mental Health took over, renaming it the Mount Pleasant branch of the Michigan Home and Training School to house and teach mentally handicapped young men, many either abandoned or criminal. Due to budget cuts and low patient numbers, the facility closed in 2010. This is the same size version, but there's almost a flip side history, one that is darker. The thought of the government was that adult Indians were a lost cause. In order to civilize the Indian, they must focus on the children, separating them from their family at a young age to easily brainwash them. They came into the house and took the children and loaded them on boxcars and in wagons and hauled them to the boarding schools. A boarding school attendance was not, man was, um, not optional, it was mandatory. My mom, she went to Mount Pleasant and when she was quite young, probably nine or ten. She was put on a train with many other Indian children. Taking Indian children from their families reflected the ethos of colonialism and the feeling that white culture was superior to Native American culture. Many Native American children were taken from their impoverished families on reservations and put into the school under the plan of lifting them out of their poor settings. But instead of just helping them learn to function in the new white man's world, they were forced to assimilate and lose their ancestral history. They knew that that child, when that child came home, would never be the same again. Originally, those schools were built to assimilate our people and to make them into farmers. And, um, help them to become civilized and live in white America. So they took away their language, their spirituality, and just wanted to teach them how to be welders and farmers and um, those kinds of industrialized jobs. For the women, they were servants, cooks, seamstresses. These hundreds of children, thousands of children that have lived there throughout the years have had everything robbed from them, their culture, their language, they've had psychological, emotional abuse. The terror started as soon as the children arrived. They were held down and had their hair cut short. Their clothing and possessions were thrown away and they were given a bath in kerosene. Finally, they were given uniforms and a new white name. Siblings were torn apart and anyone caught speaking in their native language was punished. They were taught that their belief systems and cultural ways are wrong, and that their parents were savages. Like the mental institutions of the time, physical and sexual abuse was prevalent. In the warmer months, they were rented out to local farms for work, receiving only a pittance of the wages, if anything at all. Today this would be regarded as a gross violation of human rights. 
With beatings, poor food, and poor sanitary conditions, many students escaped, fleeing back to their homes. In 1928, a report drew public attention to the conditions of these schools, and in 1933, the school closed. One year later, it was opened as a state home and training school, though no training ever occurred. Patients received only food and shelter, crammed inside dormitories. A new cropping of buildings sprung up in the 50s to house more residents, though it was not until starting in the 1960s that care improved for some of the residents, and teachers did not arrive until 1966. The higher functioning IQ students began much of the same vocational and labor training as the Indian children had some 30 plus years earlier. However, those with lower functioning IQ, such as Down syndrome patients, were left in the housing buildings and received no training whatsoever. In the 1970s, another renovation occurred, focusing on turning the site into more of a home than an institution. The large day rooms holding up to 50 patients were converted to apartments with small kitchens, housing no more than 16 residents per apartment. A new law required schooling for all mentally handicapped and it was renamed again to the Mount Pleasant Regional Center for Developmental Disabilities. The following years saw the decline of institutions and asylums, and with low admission levels and budget cuts, the facility shut its doors for good in 2010. This field is all that remains of the newer addition buildings, which are demolished in 2015, though they are still seen on satellite images. Toward the later years, these also housed Michigan's criminally insane. body was one of the roughly 200 undocumented deaths that occurred at the school. Not wanting the negative image of deaths, many children were sent home if they seemed like they were about to die, though many never made it. During the 41 years the school operated, only five deaths were officially recorded. The first building here is the woodworking and carpentry shop. Strangely, it is the most taken care of building that remains here. You may have noticed when I mentioned the training buildings, they were all for blue collar work, such as to become servants, bakers, or farmhands. No one learned how to become a doctor or lawyer here. But they didn't teach Indian children how to be parents. They taught them how to be domestics and bakers and farmers and servants.
What is this yellow thing? It's like it's a staff, dude. I'm gonna like hydrotherapy. <laughs> For those of you who haven't watched the Idlewild video, that's what I'm referencing. So get to it, please. It's Jimmy's pitch. Yep. Okay, well. See if we can see that and see. I'm not hurt you like this, but... Sewing machine oil, it says. Yeah, the thing next to it. Can you see that? Mm -hmm.
This shed is what stood near the original dining room and kitchen, now demolished. It looks like tunnels, maybe. Um, not very big though, so I don't know. Like more just like piping. So I don't really feel like I'm going This building, from what is shown on the maps, was a girl's dormitory, though it appears to have been a classroom later on. When the school opened in 1893, it had just 17 students. The same year, Central Michigan University opened just two miles away. The superintendent's house still stands, but is secure. Next, we moved on to what is both on 1930 and 1950s maps as the girls' dormitory, though upon entering, it appears to have taken on a new purpose in the years as an institution, to that of an infirmary.
plain gut sterile absorbable sur surgical suture oh, yeah this is like the medical building Yeah. So we'll inject you right there. Ch -ch -ch. Though the sign says chapel, both buildings note this simply as school, which leads me to believe it was the first building on campus, later turned into the chapel. This is the Native American language. Teacher's toilet. Yeah, it must have been like a practice room for sound. It's all carpet. They have uh, gymnast bars in here. The final building remaining, the boys' dormitory, was sealed as well, though looking through a window, it appeared emptied out and not in very good shape. 
Out in front, the remains of a wigwam, likely built for one of the remembered ceremonies held almost every year. I'm here to talk about Mount Pleasant boarding school. Grandmother went to Mount Pleasant. Let the fall off the temporary homes that we have made and broken down bodies. Watching hearts just pump the blood away from every vein I thought brought us closer to the truth. Buried in the permafrost, so we numb the pain and fall in love. Oh, yeah. And they keep on telling me I'm wrong for falling. Skyward hope to hell the drywall holds All the drawings of forever seem to miss the studs and fall Into nothing but isolating pink and squishy stuff Made of tiny bits of shattered glass Whole broken windows not enough for 